Hello, everyone. Welcome to this very special episode of Tribunet. Titus and I uh, just completed a rewatch of HBO's Rome. We wanted to do something a little special, a little more casual for hitting that 10,000 subscriber milestone. want to thank all of you guys for making that possible. It really means a lot to us. We're uh, really blown away by the support that we've seen in just under a year doing this. And so we wanted to take a break from the more academic stuff to do something that's completely subjective completely fun, and has absolutely no real-world implications. So without further ado, here is our tier list character rankings for the HBO series Rome, one of my favorite shows ever, and something that unfortunately went down way before its time. Absolutely. And I we are going to share the link to this uh, tier maker so that you guys can complete your own if you want to. All right, character number one, Lucius Varinus. First spear... Of the Thirteenth Legion, Lucius Verinus, what a guy! <laughs> he, I mean, he's he, been through it all. He really has, like, and I think he was one of the characters. I think they, a lot of them, suffer from the fact that the second season was so truncated. You know, they wanted to go for four or five, but had to condense it all. Like, he is just subjected to whiplash. I feel like, you know, he he goes, he really starts off as a very strong, like, stern legionary very conservative aligned with cato and his faction and then he just go he's literally all over the map the only constant in his life is that he uh polo is his buddy so but that being said i think kevin mckid plays him incredibly well he's super memorable and he just every stage that he's at like he plays it with conviction and so as a character i really like him obviously we can't do a historical analog with him very well but he put... was a real person, though. True. We should mention that, that Varenus and Polo existed insofar as there were guys with those names. And I think Julius Caesar mentions in his history of the Gallic Wars, it's, it's a throwaway line, but it's like, yeah, there are these two guys, uh, Lucius Varenus and Titus Polo, and no one could separate them. They were always hanging out. And I think that's the extent of what it says about them. It's, it's just that they were super close buddies. It, it actually recounts how that, that scene at the very beginning of the show where Varinus pulls him back in, it's something akin to that is in the Gallic Wars, where oh, they're, so... they're having a competition to be like, who's got more valor? Who's more brave? And the guy, and Polo, the real Polo, went out too far, and Varinus is like, we may be competing for this same position as uh, head of the Legion, but you're a fellow Roman, and I'm going to risk my life to save you. So Varinus does that, saves Polo, who went out too far into the Gallic lines, brings him back, and then Varinus gets the promotion, is is what I. Understand. I did not know that. Okay, so the basis for their personality, with Varinus being more conservative-ish in temperament, and Polo being a little bit more of a wild card, that's there in the original primary source. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I, so I feel compelled to stick Varinus in great. Yes, I'm I don't you. know about top, and I think the reason, the thing that keeps him from being top is. Like you already kind of mentioned the inconsistency because he's such he's like a a Catonian, like you said. And then in the second season, I was going back through this earlier today, he devotes himself to dis at one point. Yeah, and he he's becomes, like, I, yeah. I serve the underworld, I yeah. am an avatar of death. Yeah. And then two <laughs> episodes later, he's like, I renounce bad things. I will only <laughs> do good things. It's like Varinus, come on, man. I mean, I love that scene, though, where he's like, uh, I'm a son of Hades, and he's, he's like effectively a mafia don in the second season. Right. <laughs> like, I thought that was great, and I loved it. Uh, and it, like I said, Kevin McKidd plays him well, but I think he's just all over the board. And truthfully, all his best scenes are with Polo. Like, he doesn't have, I don't feel like he has great stuff on his own, which him and Polo, incredible together. But by himself, he doesn't do anything super memorable. So for me, I'm dropping him in good. Or sorry, great. Yeah. Great. All right. So he's he's A tier. If this is like S tier, A, B, C. Yeah, he, he would be second from the top. All right. Another big, big, big one. Although, do we have both Augusti or is it just baby Augustus? There's They're both on here. There's, you know, little Augustus and big Augustus. Or I guess you could say Octavian and then Augustus. I right. don't like either of them a whole lot and i say oh, i yeah. like there's the, the grown-up one i say i'd like the kid a little less he's just super uh off-putting and i i know yes. they're go- i know they're going for that <laughs> but like he's just uh he's literally just like a stereotype of like a like hyper 
fixated kid. And I just, I don't know. I just feel like he's not, uh, he's not very fleshed out. And if he was as smart as he's supposed to be, he would hide how off-putting he is. You know what I mean? Like, Exactly. You know. And and by all accounts, that is something that the actual Augustus Caesar was really good at doing, was like playing a part politically. Like right. he even characterized himself as, as an actor. It was like the last thing he said yes. was did have I, I played my, play part? my well, part well. Yeah. Yeah. So if to be that openly I, loathsome is maybe a little strong, but to be that openly unpleasant and conniving doesn't fit someone who sees himself as an actor. And he, he's a little bit of like... I know he's he's before Joffrey, but he's got some Joffrey oh, going on. For he's sure. got some I hadn't, like I hadn't thought of that, but I think you're right. Some Draco Malfoy, like he's just there are other characters who are kind of going for the same thing in different media who I feel more invested in. Actually, one of the scenes that I thought was most striking with with Baby uh, Octavian is when he finds out it's uh, Servilia is saying that Caesar has been assassinated, and she's like, "I want to be the first one to tell you." Oh, and, right. and your family because I hate you so much and Adia of the Julii like falls apart obviously because this is catastrophic but Octavian just has this kind of look on his face like oh no you've gone and complicated things why did you have to do that <laughs> yeah yeah it's, he's just, I, bro I, yeah he wasn't supposed to die for at least another six years you know like he I had it all planned out yeah that's that's the vibe I get from him He's one step ahead of everyone, and he's really, in the first season, he's really the only person who's Caesar's equal, and I think that's why they, yeah. Caesar takes such a liking to him. Uh, but that being said, Caesar is charming throughout the first season, and little Octavian is not. So I'm going to put him in mid-tier. Let's go mid. Let's go mid. All right, Adia. This is one who historically, again, existed. But her characterization on the show is basically completely fictional. Yeah. Or at yeah. least large parts of it are fictional. But she's awesome. Yes. I love Adia. Yeah, I think I think she's probably my favorite... I, one of... Probably my favorite female character on the show, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. She's definitely the most complex. I feel like they made her... Like, I don't like how they made her a nympho. I mean, maybe she really was, but like, like I felt like that was just something they threw in there to be like, wow, she's such a liberated woman. And it's like, she just, you know, screws everything. And I was like, you know, like she's a Roman matron. And I'm, obviously they, they, you know, that didn't mean everybody was super chaste, but I don't, I found her the degree to which she was, you know, getting into bed with everybody a little, a little off putting for somebody who was so concerned about her reputation. Like she sleeps with her stable hand, you know, like I don't, right. I don't buy that to be perfectly honest, but I think, I think maybe there's a little bit of that, that, that perhaps it's meant to be characterization. Like you get to see this, this is an Avenue of power to which she yeah. has access. Yeah. Yeah. And, but then she's like, I think the first time you see her, she like does a full frontal scene with like in front of baby Octavian, you know, it's like, it's like I feel yeah, like, in the bath, and you see yes. her with with Timon, the horse guy. Yeah, I, very I, I, early. I mean, I think I don't know. I, I just it's a little lurid for me, and I don't know. Um, she's super super complicated, and definitely, but I, I don't know. I just always found her so bizarre because she's on one hand like super Machiavellian and clever and thinking ahead, but then half the time she's also very like impulsive, and you know she's neither. Like, I feel like she's just whatever the writers needed her to be. Like, she's either a stuck-up, snotty brat who's, you know, not thinking things through, or she's, you know, playing five moves ahead. Uh, so, I don't know. I felt like she's just very conflicted. Kind of, I got the whiplash feeling that I did with Verenus with her. So, I'm putting her in good. Good. How about, how about okay. you? I, I also think um, Polly Walker's portrayal is so good like yes, she's yeah, such she's a great. phenomenal actor um i think the wikipedia page i was looking at this a day or two ago describes her as cheerfully amoral and that's one of the most dead-on summaries yeah oh of for a sure. character i've ever read just the sort of like takes no shame in the way she plays the game yeah um, there's a great scene in one of the initial episodes when caesar marches across the rubicon he has only a legion with him, so everyone's like, oh my gosh, he's never going to make it. And she is losing her mind at how mad she is at Caesar for compromising their family's position. And she thinks she'll be, you know, 
he'll be defeated, they'll be outcasts. And then Pompey decides to abandon the city because he doesn't have anyone there to defend it. Caesar ended up making the mm-hmm. right decision. And she does yep. a complete 180 where she's like, oh, Caesar, the greatest guy in the world. You know, it's just like very realpolitik, very cheerfully amoral, uh, but not to me super interesting, if that makes sense. Like I, well portrayed, not super well written in my opinion, but, and not, mm. I felt like, sh- I don't know. I'm, I'm good as my vote. You, what do you say? Good. I, I would lean, my first instinct was top. Okay. But maybe great i just enjoy watching Addie. yeah anytime she's on screen i i want to know what Addie is doing okay compared to the other characters well, um then, great or good we'll, uh, we'll spread we'll, we don't have a good yet so we'll toss no we we'll can put, put her, we can, we can put her great we'll split the difference if your initial instinct was top we'll split the difference she would definitely be among among my absolute favorites okay all right cool so moving along, we have Agrippa, who is also the... I don't remember his name. He's the driver guy from Downton Abbey. Okay. Uh, and actually, he plays a very similar character. Oh, really? Like a, super, anyway. like a super loyal, uh, you know, right-hand man type? Very loyal. Like, his come up through through virtue of his character and his grit. Like, doesn't come from connections. Just yeah. a super solid guy. I just thought it was funny. I, I had not seen Downton Abbey when I first saw Rome, but watching it again today, I was like, eh, it's actually kind of the, the same role that he's playing in a way. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I will say, out of maybe anybody on this board, he looks incredibly similar to the actual Agrippa. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think some of the casting decisions were obviously made because that was the best actor for the role, but like he's one of the few where he literally just looks the part, and I feel like if you had a time machine, that that is more or less what you would have seen. So Yeah, yeah. I, if you if any of you who are listening to this, go look up busts of Agrippa, and I guarantee you'll be like, whoa. So that's I, him. I that's like, that dude. For a guy who's kind of a wallflower, he's a top-tier character for me, simply because I feel like he's so... Like, it's such a accurate portrayal of who Agrippa probably was in real life, because... He was Augustus's right-hand man, and Augustus, you know, he served him for decades, was eventually given his daughter in marriage, and became the grandfather uh, and great-grand... Like, he, there were um, children, dece- or sorry, um, Caligula uh, and Nero were both descendants of him. So he, he mm-hmm. you know, he, he paid his dues, and he got uh, some guys on the throne. They didn't end up being good at their job, but... Uh, you know, he, he played his cards right. And so I think for him to become so well connected with Augustus, who was the consummate political um, operator, he must have clearly identified, like, this guy is not a threat. He just, he's loyal. He he doesn't have higher ambitions. And the character is super boring, but I feel like that's probably how the guy was because Augustus never identified him as a threat, never... Had no had no problem giving him command of legions, marrying him into the family, letting him mm-hmm. sire the heirs of, of the house eventually. So, my my vote would be great because I feel like that's probably more or less how the actual guy looked and acted and operated. Yeah, there. I mean, there are people like that in the world. My first yeah. instinct is to kind of be like, ah, oh, he's kind of a Pollyanna, but but those people are real. All right, let's go. Great, I like great for for Agrippa. Oh, sorry, I meant top. All right. Did I say... Oh, top. Okay, top. why not? My, my, Let's I get think, somebody I think up he, there. I think he is spot on. I really do. Yeah, yeah, you're right. He deserves it, the sunglasses. Everything we know about him fits his portrayal. <laughs> That's very true. All right, Pompey. He's out in season one. Yeah, So we don't see any of him. He only gets like seven or eight two. episodes, yeah. Um, he makes an impression, though. I really certainly. like his... Um, I think I I mentioned to you that he's got a little bit of like a former high school varsity football star vibe to him. Oh, like, like yeah, like reliving the glory days kind of. Kind of, like his glory days are not gone necessarily, yes. but he's definitely kind of coasting on reputation. Like I'm, I'm Pompey the Great. Who are you? Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's actually older in the show. He's he's, Much, he's yeah. significantly older than he was in real life and that I think contributes to the sense that he's a little bit of a has been in the show, which For I sure. don't think would have been as true in real life. Yeah. Um I think like 
my instinct on Pompey is good. I, I like, a, like, when he's on screen, he's clearly the center of attention. Unfortunately, he ends up getting outplayed at almost every turn, but that was kind of, I mean, they condensed the war. Like, Pompey was not as incompetent. Like, a lot of his decisions were probably correct. He ended up, he ended up beating Caesar in one battle. He just ended up yep. losing the one that mattered. So, uh, you know, I think they 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 also portray that he's legitimately conflicted about turning on Caesar, which um, if any of you watched our video on the first triumvirate, I think is probably pretty accurate. I don't think it, there was a clean break that occurred uh, on one day. I think they were probably always sort of conflicted about where their individual paths had led. And I, I definitely get that from the first few episodes on Pompey's, uh, from the portrayal of Pompey. So... Uh, my instinct is good. I'm gonna put him good. He's he's not around for a whole lot of time, but he he is certainly makes an impression, and I feel like he does a good job, even if they didn't quite do the historical character justice. Yeah, it's a nuanced portrayal, and he holds his own with the heavyweights of the show. Like when he's in a yes, scene with Caesar, yes, yes. he's not blown away by Caesar, which is very impressive. Yeah, because Caesar's really good, and we'll get to that. All <laughs> yeah. right, let's go good. For Pompey. All right, we have one of two Brutuses. We got a Brutus here. I think they're doing Brutus season over one, here. season one Brutus, season two Brutus, but I don't find them distinct enough. I think we can just rank rank a single Brutus. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, um, I'm a pretty big Brutus fan of uh, the way he's portrayed in the show. I like his development over time. I like his kind of father son relationship with Caesar. I like his weird, slightly edible thing with Servilia, uh -huh. his mom. Um, I, if anything, I think he gets sold on the plot to assassinate Caesar a little quickly. And, I mean, that's going to be a hard thing to write, a betrayal, you know, how, how you get to that headspace. But he's pretty adamantly opposed to it until, like, the second-to-last episode of season one. Uh -huh. And then Casca's basically like, nah, bro, it's for the Republic. Like, come on. <laughs> it's, not, it's not cowardly. It's for the Republic. And Brutus is like, yeah... That's what my family does. We save the Republic. Right, right. And then he sort of course gets, corrects. So maybe that's a little sudden. But I think... But I like it. I, yeah, I agree with you. But I like... I really like that you get to it. I feel like he's better here than in Julius Caesar, the Shakespeare play, which is my other primary reference point for a fictional portrayal of Brutus. Right. Because yep. his motives seem more human here. Like, I think he, he turns based on, like, he sees a piece of graffiti that really weirds him like really makes him upset right like it's him stabbing caesar in yeah, the head yeah i think and it's yeah and i think and like just and again that can that can go to how well the sets and the environment of the show you know becomes a character of the show itself is it's not a line of spoken dialogue but i you feel like that piece of graffiti really makes an impression on him uh, yeah. He's super conflicted about it because he's got the legacy of his family who overthrew the first kings, and then he feels like, oh, I have to kill tyrants. It's it's part of my name. It's part of our job. Yep. Uh, yep. So I'm gonna go good to good or great for my Brutus. I think good. Uh, yeah, I like good. Um, he's not necessarily one of the first personalities I think of when I think of the show. But I always enjoy seeing him on screen. Like, he's, he's very well acted. Yes. Um, let's go good. I like good for Brutus. All right. All right, speaking of major players in, in Shakespeare, we've got Casca next. And I, I was thinking just now when you were talking about the Shakespeare thing, one thing that's really cool about uh, the HBO show, in my opinion, is that if you read Julius Caesar by, by Shakespeare – maybe the pivotal scene of the whole thing is the funeral speeches. Like, uh -huh, you actually get sure. the funeral speeches uh, by Brutus and then by Antony, and that's kind of the pivot point of the whole play. You don't see him in the show, which I think was a really cool, kind of daring choice. You can't stack because, up to that, you know? It's like... Very oh, yeah. true. You're going to outright Shakespeare? Yeah, yeah very yeah. true. Um, but you hear other characters talking about their recollections of the speeches afterward, but there's not a moment of the speeches that you actually see, which uh -huh. I, I think it was bold. I think it was interesting. And I agree. I understand the motivation to, to not want to go head to head with friends, Romans, countrymen. I mean, that, that's a, it's a tall tough, order. Yeah, tough job. Uh, I find Casca, I didn't, I didn't like him a lot. Uh, I didn't think he, I thought he was very one dimensional. 
uh just kind of like i felt like he was just the devil on brutus's ears as opposed to you know like <laughs> yeah. like he wasn't a full-fledged person he was literally just like hey why don't we do like this thing you don't want to do you know so like and he didn't i don't think he had any conversations with anyone else besides like just hey brutus like want to kill this guy who you look up to so i didn't find him i mean i i don't want to say irrelevant because he he does end up <laughs> you know being uh I don't know. Mid is my vote because he he does he does end up motivating Brutus to do something. So he's not irrelevant to the course of the show, but he is uh, he just wasn't complete enough for me to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. You've got Brutus like isn't it isn't it cowardly if we're all ganging up on him and Cask is like no no man no, <laughs> yeah it's yeah not cowardly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go mid. I like that. Um, Cato, another significantly older character yes. in the show. Than and, in real life, like way it, he the real Cato died at forty nine. Yeah, he was younger than Caesar. Um, yeah. So, and this coming from a certified like Cato hater, like the real Cato, like I have no, <laughs> <laughs> like I think he is one of the biggest clowns in history, and the fact that he has <laughs> such a uh, such a reputation down to this day, I find like humiliating for anyone who uh, <laughs> pretends to study the classical world to look up to the man. So I'm a sort no, of lots of lots of early American founding fathers were very big on Cato. Yeah, they like were, Washington they... considered himself a pretty serious Catonian. Yeah, they were. Uh, they chose they chose the wrong Romans. Is is my is my standpoint on that? But how uh, how dare you insinuate? Is yeah. what I'm trying to say. <laughs> no, uh, I agree. So as a mostly, certified mostly. Cato hater, I'm still gonna say the show did not do him justice. Like, you know, as a guy who I would love it if he just got punched in the face every episode, all, all like, you know, that would be shut up. For me. Kato. But, but like, honestly, they didn't do him justice. Uh, he was, cause he's just like, there's no conviction in or Sorry. Like his only conviction is I hate Caesar. Like he's not, I think that one of the things that makes Cato the real person so reprehensible was his like super staunch, uh, dogmatic conservatism which was kind of so out of step it was just nostalgia for an age that never existed uh and i think that it would have been an effective way to kind of like diminish cato a bit in the popular standing if they had said like here's what the actual guy stood for and now let's judge yeah. him by his merits but like we don't really get his ideology or where he's coming from i think there's this great line from uh Sallust, the historian he, he, he compares Caesar, Caesar and Cato and calls them basically the two leading men of his age. And what I think he really meant by that is they were the only two guys who had like what we would call a political program, so to speak. Mm. Um, a complete vision. Yes, like a vision for society at large of like changes I want to make to it, how it can function better. Uh, everybody else in Roman politics was like, well, my vision for society is that I'm consul. You know, like, <laughs> like I have more stuff. Yeah, I have exactly. More money. Exactly. And it's like I'm consul, and then after that, my son will be consul. That's my vision for society. Like, there was no, <laughs> like, programmatic uh, desire to to make wide wide sale changes. Uh, but Caesar and Cato did, and you know, Cato's were pretty dumb. I think uh, not to say Caesar's were perfect, but Cato's were bad. But um, we don't get any of that, and I, I kind of wish we had. So. No, he's a, he's a grumpy old man yeah, is basically grump- the entirety of his character. He's a grumpy old man who wears like this like decrepit like black shawl sackcloth. And, yeah, it's like it's just so bizarre and they don't you know, obviously they're they're modeling that off of the real guy's refusal to to be, you know, in the live in the lap of luxury, but at the same time it just isn't explained well. So, I'm going to go clown or trash. Ooh, for- clown or trash. Okay. He's, because and also think about it like what does he accomplish he accomplishes jack shit in the show he get, he just gets owned repeatedly like because even <laughs> and he, then he, cell phones he, definitively yeah at the exactly end. he just gets owned repeatedly by first by pompey because he ends up giving good advice to pompey several times and pompey's like no that's stupid and like it did you know the advice had he followed it maybe would have helped but then like he just after pompey's death he just ends up definitively getting owned by caesar several times and he's just like all right <laughs> screw this i'm killing myself so uh <laughs> i'm like, out yeah like he, he <laughs> this, literally this has is ruined. i'm out other than just complaining and being grumpy he has no impact on like the course of events in the show so he's he is a clown or he is trash i'll let you decide i'm gonna go clown 
Okay. Let's go clown. Because uh, I think we have characters who... I think trash is really... Well, I don't know. Trash versus irrelevant. We, we'll have characters that we have a lot less to say about. I yeah. think that the fact that we can get a good conversation out of Kato keeps him from being utter trash, okay. at least. Okay. All right. So I know this next one is one that <laughs> we're going to disagree on because I am kind of a Servilia fan. And, and I know that you're not. I am not. I don't find her particularly engaging. I feel like she gets... Uh, She's a lot like Kato. I feel like she just gets perpetually outplayed by everyone. And uh, she's also subject to the the hyper-accelerated like, whiplash. I know that you know she's very two, two-faced with how she operates as a, as a woman in Roman society. That, that makes sense. But like, like she has like there's an episode where she has like a lesbian affair with Octavia that just I felt like comes out of nowhere and then like yeah. they break up early they, in the show. It's like oh, halfway, it's, yeah. maybe not even halfway through season one, and then it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, and it then. doesn't go anywhere, and it's just never addressed. And I'm like, wait, was this supposed to like be some? I don't know. Like, I guess my main gripe with her, I'm not opposed to somebody who fills her role on the show as like the the sparring partner of Adia. I think that was super critical, mm-hmm. but I don't yep. feel like Servilia was the historical Servilia was the right person to put into that. Uh, position because she was such a strong um you know she was caesar's longest relationship they were lovers for you know decades um and even though cato was her half brother so she was super connected to the conservative side of roman politics she still was caesar's paramour even you know he's got wives she's got husbands they don't care they they keep banging so uh the fact that like that to me the fact and like the fact that caesar was you know a notorious uh you know ladies man and and sleep slept around a lot like the fact that he kept coming back to her meant that there was something i felt like i feel like they had a relationship that he actually valued because you know and then there's even a story sounds disgusting but that she ended up offering her daughter to be caesar's new lover when she got super old after he was per- after he had been like named perpetual dictator uh and she was getting up there and i guess maybe their their fling had kind of died down a little bit she says oh well would you like to start banging my daughter the, re- the real <laughs> so it's like so that was me, her political program yeah to me like there doesn't seem to be like i don't know uh i just felt like she was probably on caesar's side with most things and she was evidently a very educated very uh very like conversant in politics poetry philosophy all of these things that women were typically not schooled in she knew these things well and to me that i, I feel like the real servilia might have been just a tad above someone like adia in terms of just like you know going for the the social standing alone i felt like you know maybe there was something more more to the real servilia so my my gripe with her is not so much if she had been named like marcella of the you know marcellii family or whatever and was a completely invented character would have a lot less of of a problem with her interesting because you know i disagree with almost all of that (laughs) i i think um the intelligence the refinement the the education i think that's there i think when i when i read real life augustus the idea of him as an actor a social actor who sort of tailors himself to whatever situation he happens to be in for maximum advantage to himself. That's what I get from Servilia. I think she's able to play a social role to her advantage very fluidly. Um, She's less impulsive than Adia, which is not saying a lot, (laughs) but I think she is a little more controlled, a little more together. And honestly, Servilia ends up driving a huge amount of the plot, which I don't think is historical, but it's her being spurned by Caesar that leads to him being assassinated. I mean, she gets in Brutus's ear after being spurned by Caesar and starts egging him on. That's one of the major factors in him deciding to go through with it. I have a, I guess that that was another thing that, that was another thing that bothered me because historically there's evidence to suggest that she had no idea it was going to happen, that Brutus kept her in the dark as to the conspiracy. So I don't know. I guess I like I said, she's interesting. I feel like she's not super. 
I don't know. I, I don't feel like she's I don't feel like she's a great character, but I think maybe subtly, like in my mind, she gets dragged down a little bit simply because I don't feel like she lives up to her historical analog. So I'm holding, and I I'm don't holding mind... that against her, which might be unfair. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind that she's a little more on the fictional side. Uh -huh. um definitely compared to some of the other heavyweights on the show she's a little more invented but i think servilia's character as a literary device that's kind of a, a through current through the entire show i i think it works it's like uh Varinus is is not there to protect caesar because servilia right. got someone to tell him about his wife's infidelity two seconds before the assassination went down and then uh She's she's sort of doing a lot of the thinking for Brutus and Cassius and their allies in the second season as a literary device and not to not to go super personal, but I actually uh, have taught English for a while. And, and as a fictional character, I'm a Servilia fan. She's also uh, she's good looking. <laughs> OK, well, I will give it to you uh, because I'm my my bias against her is more. It's not it's not TV Servilia I'm against. It's it's what they've done sure. to real Servilia. So and even though I am a kind of hater of her, I don't find her super engaging. The the suicide exit scene that she gives, uh, where she curses Adia, that's that's and she's good. covered in ash and, yeah, like, and she that's, looks like that's she's hardcore. some kind of ghoul or something. That is hardcore where um, she 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 makes herself the sacrifice to the underworld gods to uh to curse Adia like that and like an Adia who is stone faced and never you know never bothered by any of the barbs that they've traded for two seasons you can tell that she's like oh no like I really that, that's I've messed up yeah maybe I didn't want her to die like that although Adia had tortured her oh. very extensively a couple of episodes before well, I, I well I think no which I, I think, think is completely made up I don't think oh, there's sure. any historical basis for that I guess I guess what I mean by that is I think she really she messed up in terms of like oh now like the demons are gonna take my soul uh yeah, like yeah. like she because yeah. she's a she's a believer in like that magic that Servilia conducted with her dying breath like oh like that's gonna like she died so she made the sacrifice so this is gonna end up hurting me so i think that there's no taking that back yeah that. like she, like i think she's she's very distraught and it's not so much that she's lost this frenemy it's that oh no like uh you know ghosts are gonna you know get under my bed and skin me alive or something so <laughs> uh but yeah right, so, so on, on, the, on the back of be... that uh, let's i'll let you put her on the board wherever you want i'm gonna go good i would i would put her pretty far up there so I, I think good works. We're, we're fleshing out the upper half of okay. the graph for pretty sure. nicely yeah. so far. Tymon, the, uh, the horse guy. I, I, yeah. think, I think we can move quickly through him. I'd say mid. I like, I like that they gave him more to do in season two, and I really like that there was a Jewish character on the show because that kind of like yes that that you know that was like a vibrant community of Rome, and I feel like that's such a you know it's an interesting way where like the past and the present can can kind of coexist because it's like there there aren't roman pagans today but there are a lot there are people who are descendants of like time and culture still a lot around today so it's just interesting to remind like oh wow like they interacted with some facets of the modern world in a sense because you know they encountered hebrew religion and like hebrew thinking so i really like right. what they did there uh and like his his kind of turned from like becoming Adia's henchman to becoming like a more devout uh, practitioner of a like, moral guy yeah of the jewish religion was super interesting and like you know it takes him to some it, 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 he, he ends up sacrificing a lot for it and i think correct me if i'm wrong in the second very end of the second season don't they leave rome and they're moving back to jerusalem is that what's going on as they're leaving i rome, think right? so okay yeah i think so and i think his his turn is maybe a little bit oversold he turns because of the the servilia thing Adia yes, tells yeah, him he, to cut he, servilia's face off and he and just breaks. That's, that's finally enough. He says, "I'm not an animal." Yeah, that, I thought that um, was a great. I thought that was a great scene because up until then he had been, you know, like, yeah, you pay me well, I'll do whatever you ask. And then, like, I think his brother was kind of a, you know, influenced him to come back to his roots a little bit. And then he, 
So I thought it was a good, and I guess I like that he only goes through one transformation as opposed to some of the characters that go through several. So that makes his one, very true. His makes his one. He has transformation, a definitive change. Yes, it makes his one transformation more believable. I'm gonna go with good or mid because he just doesn't get a lot of screen time to get near the top. But I think what he does, he what he does do, he does do well. All right, let's go mid. All right, Niobe. Trash. <laughs> hate, hate. Completely fictional character. Oh my god! I like is is married to uh, a wonderful man who's sacrificing everything for his family, and doesn't really care. Well, doesn't I, really appreciate him. <laughs> well, I think that this is something that came to me on my rewatch uh, was that like Varinus is is I think he wants to be a good husband, but he is not in the first half of the season. Like <laughs> he is a very like. He's very cold, very domineering. Distant. Yes, he's yeah. he's very much like the archetype of like traditional Roman morality, and I think that it's like he views, you know, he commands his household like the legion. That you know, it's it's the same, which I imagine a lot of Roman fathers did, but you know, that's not a way. And to he like, also, I don't think he he really knew uh-huh. anyone in his family, including Niobe. Yeah, he's been away for so long, and, and they married early. I think he's basically dealing with a bunch of strangers when he first goes back home. Yeah. So, but I agree. Said, I don't see a lot to like about Niobe. I guess I the role, the interpersonal drama of the Varinus family, I just found to be such a distraction that I just did not. I never wanted it on screen. I hated every second of it. It's soap opera, yep. like it's just tripe. Like I just couldn't. I I didn't care because it's all like. It was literally just soap opera because it was all fueled by miscommunication, which is my least yeah. favorite kind of drama where it's like, if you sit and talk, you could solve this in three Every, seconds. All the problems yes. go away. Exactly. But it's like convenient. Was, yes. On a show that was so driven by like larger political issues and like there are big stakes on everything and you have like Machiavelli, Machiavelli and wheeling and dealing on the highest level, it is so hard to get into like, oh, well... You know, like, who's who's the real father of the baby? It's like, I don't care. I, I just do not care. <laughs> I don't you know, care. I had actually forgotten. Uh, I had forgotten that Varinus' kids survive. Because uh-huh. uh, Erastes Fullman tells him, I, yes. I took advantage of your kids. I, yeah, threw I, I the killed river. them. Yeah, and, and uh, I had forgotten. And when I got to that scene, I was like, oh, good. Well, at least that's them taken care of. Yeah. And then it showed them in the back of a wagon full of slaves. And I was like, oh, God, the Varinus get Really? They're back? Yeah. Yeah. But Niobe is not. Niobe is all the way dead. And I will say her suicide scene is one of the scenes on my first watch through where I genuinely, I think out loud, went, holy shit. Like, yeah, I was yeah. not expecting her to catapult over a balcony and yeah. land on her face. And, and no disrespect, I think the actress does a good job. And, like, there are scenes with her and Varinus that I really like where, like, I think when they, they buy the farm and they're blessing the field and it's clear, like, they're in love. Like, it's a great portrait of, like, like Roman, simple, at-home Roman life, I guess. And, like... Yeah. That's something I, as you know, our entire the entire point of our channel is to tell like those kind of stories. That being said, that's not why I was watching this show, and I felt like every moment of the Verini family and their drama was just, I just hated every second of it. So I'm putting, like, you know, unless you disagree with me, put him, his daughter, his son, the sister, the sister's husband that like Niobe has an affair with, all of them are trash. I don't do want we want to go ahead and just dump the family in there? Just dump the Varinuses in there because I don't want to. I don't want to give my rant it. another six times. Truthfully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. This is the the illegitimate kid. Um, I'm trying to spot the other ones. That's is the this daughter. A I think. I think that's his daughter. Yeah, that's his youngest daughter. Well, if she's not, we don't remember who she yeah, is. Yeah, <laughs> she so. doesn't matter anyway. Into the trash with you. Um, who else are we do, missing? The, the youngest the daughter has son. an... The youngest daughter does have an amazing scene where she, uh... What does she do? Uh, like, where she's collecting the graves from the altar to Venus, and, like, like running... She So she walks through the city, and it's empty, because they've just declared martial law that Caesar's come back in. So it's, like, it's yeah. one of my favorite scenes in the city where... Or series, where she's... The city's empty, and you really get to see the gorgeous set they've made, and it's, like, 
amazing to like because it's so lived in it's so authentic it's not like this sterile white marble it is a city with like pig shit on the ground which you know Mm -hmm. is really accurate so gaudy color everywhere that scene is almost a little bit reminiscent of like when i think back to early covid seeing some of the you know like times square and places like yeah, that yeah, yeah. deserted that eerie feeling of like oh god this is really big yeah. that is a cool scene characters are not great no but that is a cool scene i appreciate sure. her being our tour guide through that little moment but that's all like that's all i'll give to her uh yep. all right so cleopatra um this one i feel like could be super divisive i feel like your your feelings on cleopatra could be very hit or miss what did you think of her I I kind of feel divided about aspects of her character. I think in season one, when she's traveling around in her sex litter, smoking opium all the time, uh, I think that was truly a bizarre choice. I do like the insinuation that Titus Polo fathered her child with Caesar in reality. And you never get definitive proof that Caesarian is actually Polo's kid. But I, I thought that was cute. That was fun. Um, that was a nice. I like that was her. A, that was an interesting distraction, or like, or, sorry, that was an interesting addition. I felt like, uh, and I I like that they did it in a way that, um, like Caesar never doubts, which I think is the important thing because in in all in all likelihood Caesar truly believed that uh, Caesarian was his kid, whether you know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and I do think she is portrayed well as a political operative. Yes. I think some of the personal stuff in season one is a little kind of eh, a little wild maybe. I, I think Especially given what of... we know about Cleopatra, which is yeah. that she was a very well-educated, very mm-hmm. put-together, uh, very composed kind of woman. So to see her as like a drug addict having yeah. orgies in a tent. Yeah, I think they. Uh, I think they were just trying to show like the decadent East versus like the stoic West. I think was sure the motivation there. Regard and like there just weren't other Egyptian characters that they could make into like the opium den uh, inhabitants. So she kind of got that job. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. As a character, I I felt like she was a worthy adversary for uh, Octavian in season two. So I thought she was a good. I think so. I don't want to and say I like, like the, antagonist because he's not really the Octavian's not really the protagonist, but she's a she's a good foil for him. Yes, yes, because she yeah. isn't. She and is I, in I every like way, her. She is in every way his opposite, I think, and I think that's what makes their. They only have I think like one scene together at the very end, which is a great scene where he's like, "Come to Rome and I'll treat you well," and she's like, "Oh, she's totally gonna kill me," you know, like, uh, yeah. So she kills her. She ends up, you know, famously. Uh, using the cobra to poison herself but like it's a great scene because there's it's all subtext there's but like there there are so uh you know they're so polite and civil to each other but um i would say i also think her scenes with antony where they they uh kind of loathe each other at first but in a a very sexually intense kind of way i i like that's fun it's not maybe the the greatest uh, storyline on the show but those two there's definitely some chemistry between them that's fun to watch yeah i agree i think i think they sell her well as like a like she's not a femme fatale in the sense of like she's not like this perfect like seduction machine but like she clearly wa- she knows how to like pull and push and uh get what she wants out of out of powerful men and i think that like her having her way with Caesar and Antony, like, in quick succession. Like, basically, she chooses her targets and she gets them. Uh, I think that's pretty, uh, you know, the way it's done is not, like, it doesn't feel, like, artistic. Like, I don't know, how, how can I say it? Like, it's not uh, arbitrary. Like, she, she earns right, it, right. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. And speaking of seduction machines, I think there's one character who who is exactly that, the character who they lean hardest into the raw sexual appeal angle more than any other character, and that is the announcer guy. <laughs> Just an incredible physical charisma. Oh my gosh! From he announcer is, guy, he is he's he's a he's a goat character. We'll get to him later. Um, um, okay, all right. I was yeah. gonna go ahead and toss him in, but oh, all right, okay. Cleopatra. I would say good. Good, great. I would say good. Good. Uh, and if okay. while we're on the subject of the announcer man, I don't know if he has a name. 
Love him. Love every second of him being on screen. The hand gestures, the little oh digging God, thing great. he does. Gaius Julius Caesar. And I love how, yeah. I love, like, I believe you described Adia as cheerfully amoral. He is also, in many, in many senses, the same because he's reading, like, proclamations for Caesar, against Caesar, for Antony, against Antony. Yeah. Like, like it's yeah. literally whoever's in control of the city right now, I'll say what they want me to say. Like he's, uh, he's the mainstream media man. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's. I think that's definitely what they were going for. But like, he's just totally immoral. Right. He's like, I read what they put in front of me, but he reads it well, and he looks. He looks so in place. Like him and like we said, Agrippa, the announcer guy. Like I can totally buy that as the guy who's delivering news in the forum. So oh, I'm, like he's been doing this for forty years. Oh yeah, this is all yeah. that this guy has ever done. It's all he wants to do. You know. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, top, 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 top yeah, of no top. question. Like, uh, yeah, love him, love him, that big boy. Um, <laughs> so is Erastes, All right, Erastes Fullman? Uh, the, mm, yeah, mid criminal, I I criminal yeah. underworld type figure. He gets his. I had forgotten that he gets decapitated by Varinus, and then Varinus keeps his keeps head. his head. Yeah, because yeah. it brings it brings him some pleasure to gaze upon it. Is what Polo says. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it calms him down. Yeah, or the only, like that. yeah, it's like the only joy he has left in his life after he thinks his family <laughs> is dead is just looking at this guy's severed head, which is pretty dark. But um, I don't know. I didn't find him super interesting. He's just like evil for no reason, and like like he's not a pragmatic evil where it's like a mafia boss where it's like okay i do have to break some arms to get things done like he's just like oh i want to like i'm gonna pick a fight i want to hurt like, people yeah and he's like i want to hurt weak people i want to hurt vulnerable and well, innocent people well, it's, and it's for not, fun it's not even that it's like you'd think a guy who's you know a don of the roman mafia would be like so what i'm not gonna do is pick a fight with like this established legionary like killing machine who's like also one of caesar's best friends like you know it's like there are people not saying he would uh he had would have certainly have had no moral qualms with like picking fights with people but like the pre like you've got to re like i feel like somebody in that situation would be like no it's not pragmatic to be picking fights with uh one of the most dangerous men in rome who's also incredibly well connected and Varinus. He's allies with yeah, yeah all of the most powerful figures yeah and like and, and another thing and this is not really Caesar fair. Caesar even makes him a senator and he still goes after his kids it's like no dude like you got to let sleeping dogs lie at that point like you know you <laughs> so I don't for know. sure I don't and, know. and this is not fair but this is this is early two thousands HBO or mid aughts HBO uh -huh. and this is this is an Italian mafia figure the whole time he's on screen. I'm just thinking, God, I miss Tony Soprano. <laughs> yeah. I would so much rather be watching yeah. Tony Soprano right yeah. now. They, He's they, even got kind of the jewelry. He's got oh, the gaudy, it's, I think tasteless yes, kind of thing yes, going on. Yes, exactly. He's he's just got, yeah, he's just got, he's dripped out in gold. But it, you're right. It, in, in like somebody who doesn't know what the conventions of Roman like uh, aesthetics are, I'm still like, he doesn't look right. Like he's just, he just is wearing the four biggest rings he could find, you know, like. <laughs> so definitely the characterization there is good. That being said, I don't like the that character in the sense that I don't feel like he's pragmatic enough in a show that's very grounded. So I'm gonna put him in I would say clown. I don't I don't I don't I, don't, I didn't buy him as a worthy adversary. Like he gets the better of Varinus, but it's it's arbitrary. I felt like it's it was the writers just doing that to screw Varinus over, whereas Varinus made the right choices and should have been protected against the guy so i'm cl i'm clown for fullman all right let's go clown then and i already have a strong feeling about where i want to put this next guy cicero a little bit of a cato vibe with him a I... little bit not specifically in his politics but in the kind of reduction yeah. that has been done to fit him on screen. I feel like he suffers more than any other character in terms of, yeah, like having to share the stage with so many other people in a sense, like, and, you know, not... Because you could have done a whole show about Cicero navigating these tumultuous times, right? Very oh, easily. for sure. I mean, he when, is, like him or not, he is one of the the defining personalities yes. of the age. He's, yes. he's a figure that must be contended with by everyone, 
And you don't get that sense no. with this version of Cicero he's, at all. He's an utter punching bag. Yeah, he is a complete punching bag. And, like, obviously the real Cicero was very vacillating and very, like, uh, you know, he followed the political winds. Like, he was not a man of strong convictions other than advancing his own career. But sure. that being said, this Cicero is just such a, like, a sniveling weakling who, like, just gets, you know, told what... It seems like he's getting told what to do by everybody. And the thing He's wringing his hands. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, oh, you, literally, you may literally. yet live to regret that. I don't know. Yeah, don't yeah. Know. Like, <laughs> I'm going to write a blog post about this, sir. Like, it's that's literally, like, the vibe I get from him. And then they couldn't <laughs> even do him... And the whole time I'm watching, they couldn't even give him the justice of making him, like, a good order or a good wit. You know, like that's and that's absolutely unforgivable. In my, like that's the defining characteristic of Cicero is that he's well spoken. Yeah, and, and and he's an eloquent writer. And and that's not even hard to do because you can have, obviously, maybe they did not want like a whole another political party, for lack of a better term, in seasons one and two, where you're you're they're torn between like three different poles. So they didn't give Cicero the like because they were like Cicero is the leader of the moderate faction, and it's like what does the moderate faction do? Nothing. In the show, yeah. so like they get bullied by yeah. the other two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, yeah. I mean, and and for somebody who is supposed to be such an impressive speaker, it feels like half the time he's getting up and he's like, "I I would like to say something." Yeah. And someone's like, "Shut up, nerd!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of goes yeah, so- sorry and sits he, down. Yeah, and like, he's he just gets and like he literally gets bullied by Mark Antony like so many times, and then uh, so yeah, I can't and I can't like I can understand why they don't make him into a his own political force for the sake of condensing the story but at least if he's gonna be around give him some good lines or one good speech and he i don't think he had any so now the closest he gets is his letter condemning mark antony but, has some nice little caddy bits in it that's great because it's taken from the real thing but also yeah. that's another like unforgivable injustice they did to him and again i'm not a cicero fan by in the slightest just like i'm not a cato fan but they give like he gave those speeches in person like it was an actual politically like daring thing for him to do it was a yeah. series of several speeches that he gave on the floor against antony and he felt like there's a good chance i could pay for my this with my life which he ended up which ended up actually happening but in the show right he has some other guy read it and then bark antony beats the other guy his friend to death and it's just like <laughs> like so he you know like he doesn't have the conviction to like he's like oh i wrote this great speech why don't you deliver it and get like bludgeoned to death by mark anthony like it's, it's such... totally like like your blog post thing is so dead on the more i think about yeah. it it's like He's he's trying to cyber bully Mark Antony. <laughs> yeah, and Mark before Anthony it was just, a thing. Mark Anthony just has him blocked. He doesn't even know what he's. Yeah. Like, or Mark Anthony doesn't. What even, if I kill you? Yeah. What if I kill your friend? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I would say like Cicero. This guy. This Cicero is trash. Truthfully, he's he doesn't he doesn't deserve. And I'm not. If the actor who played him, if you're watching, this is nothing against you. This is just what what the writers did to it, man. Uh, I think if he had been called Roman Senator yeah, number 10, or anonymous. if they'd yes, made up a yes. name for him, yes. that could have been a cool character. But Cicero, yeah. like from the jump when I first started watching the show, from the first scene he was in, I was like, that's not Cicero. The, well, for no. the first, yeah, I, I specifically remember in my first watch through expecting like, he's going to do something cool soon, right? You know, like, and then like, it just never happens. Uh, so... Anyway, like, I just remember I kind of like his death scene. It's the yeah. one thing I'll say. Cicero gets to shine for a moment in his death scene. He accepts it very stoically. He takes a moment to kind of prepare himself for the transition. And then Polo gives him a good stab in the clavicle. But uh, he doesn't run. He doesn't try to write a, a sniveling note. He stares death in the face and accepts it. And I think that's the one moment of dignity that the show gives him. Yeah. And then he gets his hands cut off. <laughs> yeah, not enough in my view. I'm going to say trash. Trash into the trash mm-hmm. and we have another Varinus kid here. Goodbye. Trash. trash. Man. Yep. Um who is this guy? He was the mob leader in season 2 and he gets owned, Oh, he's another underworld guy. Yeah, he gets owned even harder than Fullman cuz I think they literally Oh yeah, Polo bites his tongue off and then they keep him in a oh, cage and treat him like a feral animal. And it's just, like, <laughs> like, it's, like, very dark. Like, 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 he's, like, like, I don't remember even what he did to deserve that. Like, I just remember him being, 
like a rival mafia guy, underworld figure, but like I don't the fact that I don't remember anything about him other than him just getting brutally owned means I'm gonna say clown <laughs> tier for, for him. Let's put him in irrelevant. I, uh, yeah, I, I got that's, a, that's, a, a that's thing fair. where I need to Let's fill up all the tiers. There we go. This is more visually satisfying. Okay. You know, he he literally explain. is... Actually, he breaks out of the cage, and I think he... <laughs> he does something. I don't remember. But, yeah, irrelevant. I can't even remember. But no. Okay, he, so we got Brutus again, and then Gaia. I did not like her. Uh, I thought, no. I felt like she was not interesting, and then, like, her... Her fling with, like, I don't even remember, because she murders Polo's wife, Irene, and I don't even right. remember why. Like, she just wanted Polo for herself. Like She's trying to get in with Polo, but she also does the same thing with Varinus. She sleeps with Varinus, yeah, and yeah, he agrees. She's... And then know. he wants to pay her, but she won't take the money. She feels like a plot contrivance. And yeah. the thing is, she's a plot contrivance that isn't even really doing anything. Yes. The she worst, doesn't really advance <laughs> the worst the story. Ki- the worst kind of plot contrivance. I would say yeah. ir- irrelevant. We're two in a row on irrelevant. I don't, I don't... Let's do it. I mean, she does kill one of the main characters, but that's not enough to save her from irrelevance. Uh, yeah. All right, we got another repeat. Well, then we'll see. Oh, yeah, Lepidus. I, I will say, though, it, while oh, do we we're want to rank- sort of passing Oh, yeah, over- I guess we should rank Big Boy Augustus. He's Big leader. Augustus. The, the one thing I'll say that I really like about Big Augustus is it's uncanny the degree to which the older actor nails the mannerisms and the speech patterns yeah. of the kid. Yeah. They genuinely seem like they could be the same person. He, he Not an especially interesting person. <laughs> he has the haughty, like, like arrogance down to a T. Uh, and he's a little more human than the kid. The kid is super weird and off-putting and like i feel like the older augustus is like oh i know i'm a freak but i need to hide it you know yeah <laughs> like i need <laughs> kind to... of a mark zuckerberg vibe. yeah oh i for also sure. enjoy things that people <laughs> like well funny you should mention it you know mark zuckerberg has that haircut because he idolizes the real augustus right really, really? i did not know that he has the roman haircut he has the augustus haircut specifically because he needs the little he needs the little fringe yeah augustus he needs... is, he's always got the bangs yeah so or the the bang or two let's put very front. let's put uh big augustus one notch above little augustus in the good tier okay so he's going into good yeah that makes sense he's he's not he's not great but he's better than the kid i think uh lepidus I didn't like Lepidus at all. He's a complete everything you just everything we said about Cicero being a pushover. You Cicero can, syndrome. You can yep. you can double for Lepidus because he was a guy who literally had it had his act together. He was Caesar's right hand man after you know Caesar and Antony had a falling out. They were reconciled by the time of Caesar's death, but uh, Lepidus was like. But he's an accomplished general. Yes, like, he was one of tough Caesar. guy, savvy political operator, yeah, and his uh, like. Yeah, so, but they do him no justice. He's literally just, I don't think they explain why he's even in the second triumvirate. He's just there, and then they're like, oh, yeah, you don't count. And he's like, yeah, you're right, I, I suck. Like, he's just like, he's, he's not just bullied. He's like, <laughs> accepts that he's being bullied. And he's just like, yeah, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything. So I think he's Yeah, trash. I think he gets two scenes. I think it's like two scenes, and the first time he shows up, Mark Antony, like even the actor is sort of visibly disappointed. He's like, no, oh, Lepidus. Mm, yeah, yes. yeah. So I'm going to put him, let's say Trash. Just he doesn't, trash. Deserve, he doesn't deserve to wear the boots of Mr. Real Lepidus. Caesarian. No, massive downgrade from, from the real one. Caesarian. Caesarian doesn't mm. do a whole lot. No, he doesn't. I think the kid is, he really nails like the being born to the queen, you know, like like being the heir to the throne Vibe, completely like, insulated from yes, real life. Yes, completely insulated from real life. A completely like insufferable, like n- not just like a brat, but like a nerdy brat who's like you know has literally never even wiped his own nose. Like he he nails that really well. But I don't know. They just don't give him enough, and I don't feel like uh... he seems a little almost like brain damaged, kind of. But I guess that's what happens I mean, to those people in real life. Yeah. It is a kind of brain damage. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. There's there's no way you grow up as the heir to the throne 
especially then, and turn out normal. And I think that yeah. he's, he is not normal. Um, I don't know. I'd say mid for for Caesarian. Mid, it's, I would I would drop him down to irrelevant. All right. I don't see anything to separate him from the other kind of who's it characters. Okay, go for it. Irrelevant. He doesn't. Uh... You're right. And then up next is that um, Calpurnia, Caesar's wife. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, good call. I was struggling to remember too. She's not bad. Uh, she's, she's not. She great. doesn't. She's not given much to do. Right. She's um, not given I, much to do, and I think that like. They very clearly expressed that her and Caesar's marriage is a political one. He doesn't seem yes. particularly captivated by her. She likes being married to the most powerful man in Rome, but as to the guy she's married to, that's not really that doesn't even really enter into the equation, right? So uh, I think she's good. I just rewatched her scene where she's presenting Caesar's corpse to Servilia. Uh huh. And that is pretty good. Okay. It, it, I, it, she seems genuinely grief-stricken. I think she says something like, look at what you've done to him or something like that. And then uh, Caesar's corpse gets breastfed shortly huh. after that. I don't know what that is meant to be a reference to. I think but, I... Uh, certainly not a tradition that has survived. I either... To my knowledge. I either missed that or I willfully blocked it out of my memory forever. Yeah, uh, I had a moment kind of like, whoa! I was not <laughs> expecting her to do that with um, but I, I, I find her irrelevant. She just doesn't do much. Um, and yeah. I think that that's an accurate portrayal of the real Calpurnia. She was not... Uh, you know, Caesar had plenty of women, and none of the ones that, uh, you know, his wife just doesn't appear to be one... His final wife, his fourth wife, just does not appear to be one of the ones that he was particularly drawn to. He liked, yeah. her, fa he liked her father-in-law, or he liked his father-in-law, her father, a lot, which probably explains how the marriage actually happened. Yep. So Okay, this next one, I think we're both a little more fond of. We've I been filling him. up the low tiers love so far. Love the man, love the but man. Pasca... Yeah, it's Caesar's slave, but also kind of his uh, consigliere. Yeah. Speaking of I, uh, the I, Sopranos, he's a little I mean, bit of I a think, Silvio figure. I think that the mafia language is is certainly apt. Like that's basically his job. I think I get more of a I got more of a Tom Hagen vibe from him, like the Godfather consigliere, uh, yeah. because you know yep. he's an outsider uh, in the in the in that organized business, but. Yeah, but for sure, I I like Pasca. He is he is whip smart, and he is really the only guy Caesar actually asks for advice from. Because he'll talk to yes. Octavian, and he'll be like, "Oh, that's very good that you're picking up on the subtle machinations." But like, he doesn't say to Octavian, "What would you do?" And then do it. Like Pasca, and Pasca actually gets to talk back to him and gets to question him open. Like he's his slave, and he's. It's He's questioning him. It's in almost front of a other little people. bit like a marriage. There's oh, yes. a little bit yeah. of a marriage dynamic between yeah. the two. Yeah. And like, I think... like Pasca will say stuff and Caesar will be like, Shut up. Well, of course you would say that. Yeah, and yeah, you can yeah. See yeah a few yeah. moments later, he's like, I'm I'm sorry, Pasca. I didn't mean to Yeah. I think I think Pasca is great, and I think he's he's definitely the most visible slave on the show, which I thought was you know, it's natural that that's gonna be like a highly educated Greek, because um, that was yes. such a a hallmark of the great Roman houses to like, you know, basically just keep a smart Greek guy <laughs> chained, uh -huh. chained to the door, uh, but like <laughs> to the radiator. Yeah, basically. Uh, <laughs> but like, uh, but yeah, I think that was, that was a great way to show that how, like, I guess there were multiple facets of Roman slavery and that like the, the guys like Pasca, like they were slaves, but you know, Roman slaves could actually own their own slaves. And like, he's the kind of slave who would, be like, oh yeah, I've got slaves too. You know, like he's he's very high up in the system, and he yeah. he clearly he 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 gets his freedom in season two, and he kind of lives it up a bit. But like, I think he was happiest when he was with Caesar. But I thought their dynamics with Caesar are great, um, and I, I like. Yeah, I mean that was his husband. He lost his yeah. husband basically. I, I, yeah, I, I like one. watching. I like watching two really smart characters talk about like the politics and their plans in a way that is not like i felt like game of thrones near the end got super contrived where it's like i'm gonna do the plan and it's like oh wow your plan and i'm is gonna great. explain all my rationale yeah. out loud yeah. so that you know why i'm doing it but like rome they'll do like caesar will definitely like the way he talks about his plans a it's obviously done so the viewer can understand what's happening 
but it's always done in such a very clever way that I think is true to the characters and true to the true to the 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 scene they're trying to build. So Pasca is an integral in that. I would put him at the top. Top. Let's do it. Um, also, final thought on Pasca is the actor is so good, and it's kind of a risky performance in that he, he doesn't really do much with his face or with his tone of voice, and it could read as boring or, or uninventive, but the, the actor himself has so much intensity, and you get the sense that there's such a storm happening behind that stony yeah. face. Yeah. He really sells that quality, which is tough. I don't think that's something most people can do. All right, Baldman. I don't know who that is, truthfully. I don't know either. All right. Trash? Trash. Irrelevant? Yeah, trash, trash or irrelevant. I don't know who you are. Um, Sorry, Baldman. And this lady is who? Mm, I remember her being in the show. Yeah. I don't remember what she does. Well, then you're irrelevant. Sorry. Yeah. And this... All right. This guy I had completely forgotten about until my rewatch. He's this 16 year old kind of schemer, prostitute, hitman oh, guy. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, wait. And actually, that reminds me the bald guy we just dropped into trash is the slave of Adia. He's Adia's Pasca. That's right. That's okay. right. And I actually. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote him to that's, irrelevant. That's based not on a that good. That's not a good picture of him but there's a good scene in one of the earlier episodes where him and Pasca are talking I would put him mid actually uh because now that I remember okay. there's a great scene where he and Pasca are talking and they're like they're very they're in very they're both Greek slaves that are very educated they're the heads of like the household so to speak they're the the chief slaves of their respective aristocratic owners and uh they really uh yeah, they get it. Um, like it's their their conversation is very funny because like they, they're clearly like not happy about being slaves, but they clearly like they like that they're able to boss the other. Like the other slaves are bringing them water and wine, and you know like there's a hierarchy within the slaves, and I thought that that was a great scene for establishing that. And uh, yeah, and he's he's they they he's not as smart as Pasca, but you get the sense when he's who is pa- what the who is who yeah, is as yeah, smart as yeah. Pasca. But they're, they're, you get a sense that like they're at least uh, they're at least dealing with the same stuff. So, uh, bald guy who is Adia's main slave, you get promoted to mid. Congrats. Um, oh yeah, this guy and that was his. This this boy seduces that slave of Adia's because he's working for Servilia, right? Yeah, yeah, and he he for well, he demands that Servilia kiss him if he's going to yes, kill Adia. Yes. And she kind of goes, shut your mouth. And then he's like, no, really, you, you have to kiss me if you want me to kill this woman. Interesting choice. I don't know what they were going for with that. Maybe to show the extent to which Servilia was willing to debase herself in service of revenge. Kind of an annoying character, though, yeah. in all honesty. Yeah, like, and it, he's just got that shit-eating grin. I don't, and I felt like he got into the, because he seduces... Adia's main slave but then like that I feel like he just like his his entrance into the house and the degree to which he like escapes sus- suspicion until like obviously he gets found out is I just felt like it was very contrived so they, they it was a it was a plot they could have done without because Adia and Servilia already hate each other you don't need like you don't need to cross a line between the two right uh Yep, yep, and he does, um, he attempts to poison Adia, and it ends up accidentally killing that same servant girl, and then he gets, like, like, flayed, yeah, I think, I, I don't Adia's remember. Basement. I don't remember what happened, I remember he got, he got it bad, I just, like, I just remember he got, like, sent to the rack, basically, and it was not pretty. Yeah, they, they, like, peel his face off, and then I think Timon the horse guy stabs him, A I lot. think. Yeah. I, I just that, remember yeah. it being, I just remember it being unpleasant, whatever. Whatever he his his final fate, but you know somebody with that face, I, I'm not mad at it necessarily. <laughs> uh, I would say clown because his plan was stupid. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't going to work, buddy. Uh, no, he was he was an unwelcome presence for as long as he was around. Yeah, and this uh, this fellow, who are we looking at? He's the he's the one who cucks Varinus. Oh, he's he's oh, the trash, guy who trash. sleeps yeah, with <laughs> Niobe's 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 
sister's husband. Yeah, and it's like, Niobe, come on. Like, if you're going to sleep around, not your sister's husband, man. Come on. Have some class. And this guy. What what is what is remotely appealing about this yeah. sweaty, anxious yeah. man? <laughs> yeah, he, he was... Oh, and then he ruins their feast. Varinus is like... Uh, he has like a big feast to like welcome back. I'm starting a I'm starting a business, and he ruins it by like because he can't keep it. He's like, oh, I have to tell everyone how much I love Niobe. No, you don't, dude. You're married. Calm down. <laughs> um, yeah, didn't like him. Didn't like any of it. Trash. Yeah. Yeah. E- easy trash for yeah. him. All right, this guy is he hangs out he- with. Augustus, well, he's not Augustus yet. He hangs out with Octavian and Agrippa. Yeah, I, he's a real character, and I'm blanking on the name, but he was basically the... He was basically the equivalent of Agrippa, but for, like, culture and propaganda. So he's the guy who, you know, if you if you like Virgil, this is the guy you have to thank for it. He was... Um, I, I can't remember his name, but he was, yeah. he was basically another... Um, kind of assistant of Octavian who who helped make the Principate more viable to people. Uh, I didn't like the character, though. Um, he has, like, two or three scenes, and he's he's basically his only thing he does is be rich and annoying, like, and be, like, very awesome. And, and just not as cool as the two guys yeah. he's constantly yeah. surrounded by. And, like, for some reason, like, it just, obviously he's based on a real guy who evidently was very helpful to the real Augustus, but... Uh, this guy just doesn't seem to have any advice that actually is important or like that Octavian wouldn't have thought of already. And he, I remember his like this line where he's like, I told you to be discreet. And he's like, cause he comes in this, like this palanquin, this incredibly ornate palanquin. And he's told like, I told you to be discreet. And he's like, this is my third best leader. And it's like, <laughs> okay, you like you little, <laughs> like he's the kind of guy who would not only have, more than one but like rank them you know like exactly like uh and and he, his his face it, he, he's got very like 17 year old attempting to buy beer <laughs> at a gas station vibes like no man i'm in college like you can't be in college unless you're 21 yeah exactly least. yeah all right uh irrelevant, irrelevant. clown it, even it, it, i would say yeah we could drop him to clown we're, we're, we're short on clowns put him in a clown clown college is open into uh, the clown car he goes. And then Octavius. All right, in all time. honesty, we we have a little bit of, to me, a dry spell on this line that we're looking at. Yeah. So we've got some, I mean, we got Polo. We got Timon's brother. I think it's Simon. Timon and Simon. Timon and Simon. <laughs> I think it is Simon. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it is. That's, that's like Mario and Wario here. <laughs> uh... Well, okay, we can be quick about these next couple. I would say that Octavia's first husband, he's like, he's just a contrivance because he's so perfect. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. he's so perfect. Like, it's it's embarrassing, like, how one-dimensionally, like, he's literally Prince Charming. Like, everything he does is perfect. And, like, even Model when, of Roman virtue. Yeah, even when Timon's about to murder him, he's like, uh, he's like, oh, well, one thing, please don't kill my slaves. And it's like... It's like, dude, this guy just, this guy. What this, a guy. This guy literally just said like, hey, I'm here to kill you. And he's like, you know, like, and he just accepts it. And he's just like, well, I ask that you don't kill my slaves. You know, it's like, he's just so perfect. So I, and it's funny because Octavia just gets dragged through the mud in so many ways. But, you know, this is the guy she clearly wanted to be with. So I would say he's mm-hmm. mid in the sense that like he, he is the, he is the main wedge between Octavia and her mother. Actually drop him to irrelevant because that doesn't even. She doesn't even stay mad at her mom for that long. Like no, <laughs> you no, could, and she doesn't. She doesn't really grieve for him beyond I think an like episode, an episode, an episode or two, and then it's just like, uh, yeah, it's like, oh, I'm so mad at my mom, and then like three episodes later, it's like I love her again, and now I love her best friend, and now I have a new boyfriend named Agrippa. So, yeah, Octavia's all over the place, but yeah, he's irrelevant. And then her friend Jocasta, also irrelevant. I didn't like her. I didn't like anything. This she is did. the she's the she's the weed the weed yes, friend. She, yeah, she literally she, she's the stunner. She's like, hey, smoke this shit, man. Yeah, I it love. It makes it feel like the walls are melting. <laughs> she's the what's the, um, oh, dang it, Walk Hard that movie. <laughs> You don't want any There's of this. No hangover. You don't want any of this, do we? <laughs> like she's she's the, she's doing that for uh, uh, for Octavia. She's basically just like telling her like you don't want to go to this orgy. 
It's like, oh yeah, you do. It's like, <laughs> you don't want to start smoking pot. Like, I think that this character was basically just introduced to like, so that they could be like, oh, well, we're on HBO. We can show sex and drugs. Let's do it. You know, like... Yeah, honestly, a lot of the drug stuff... And, and granted, this is kind of a historical blind spot for me. I don't know a ton about the history of drugs. But... And maybe that's something we could dig into eventually. But all of the drug stuff feels very consciously modern to me. I mean, she has, like, a joint. Yeah, It's not yeah. like they're smoking out of some kind of earthenware or something. She has, like, a perfectly rolled joint. Yeah, and there's a... And, and hands you, If it. you look closely, there's a Dazed and Confused poster in her room, too. It's very, like... How did they... I don't, I don't know oh, how the, they... the beaded curtain on the <laughs> yeah. door? Yeah, now that and you lava, mention it. And a lava lamp, too. I don't know how they missed it all. But uh, it's like that star <laughs> that Starbucks cup that showed up in uh, Game of Thrones. It's kind of like that. Yeah. So, but this was just a whole, you know... There was a, <laughs> a VW bus, even. So... Um, but yeah, I didn't like her cast. I didn't think she was super interesting. She does marry, you know, one of the goats in uh, Pasca. She does marry That's Pasca. That's very true. And she also seduces Pasca into like the easy living lifestyles of the East because they move to Alexandria. And I think you see, you don't see Pasca for like two episodes because he's in Alexandria with uh, Antony. And then he shows up and he's married to her. And he's wearing like eyeshadow and all this like Eastern decadent gold and stuff. And it's just a, like, she's just a bad influence on a lot of people. But um, yeah, he's, anyway. he's surrendered to the siren song yeah. of, uh, of Greek degeneracy. But that being said, she's basically cast. She's basically Casca of, but for drugs instead of for murdering, uh, <laughs> for murdering Caesar. <laughs> so. uh, let's fill up clown. All right. Clown irrelevant. She could be a clown. She doesn't feel trash. She doesn't do to anything. Me. She doesn't. She's. She. Don't, I don't. Other than doing drugs, I don't know what she does. She could be clown. Yeah. Or irrelevant. I don't. Because trash to me, like these. These are aggressively bad characters who yeah, they, actively harm the show. Yeah. She's not that. She, she's maybe a little odd, a little little cutesy, but yeah, not actively terrible. Yes. Yes. Uh. All right. Simon. Simon. Simon of Timon. <laughs> uh, he's fine. He's alright. I like I like that they introduced him to like introduce some of the the politics uh, that were happening in Palestine at the time. I thought that was super interesting and like how his brother like they're at that point like they're both very like observant faithful Jews, but they have like a strong disagreement over what the best like do we oppose Rome with force or do we like just kind of work with them and hope do we the pick best? a horse and bet on him? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I thought and like that's you know inaccurate because like. I think that's very consciously like they're embodying two of the dominant parties of like the, the Jewish revolt that happened, you know, like, uh, I guess a hundred years after the show was set. So I think that was, that was very well done how he's kind of the analog to his brother. They're both like acting authentically, but having a very firm disagreement that ends up with Timon murdering his brother over it. Uh, so, you know, I thought he was... Let's go with Mid. Let's put him with his brother. Mid. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm lost. That on this one. is uh, Livia. The wife of uh, Augustus. Oh, yeah. I didn't like yeah. her. She's okay. She's all right. Yeah. I guess I'm also like... I didn't like this portrayal because I think having seen I, Claudius, I don't know... If you're familiar with that uh, old BBC show. Livia. No, I haven't watched it. I, I know what it is, okay. but I haven't seen well, it. Well, Livia is basically presented as, you know, the the end-all, be-all political operator, the smartest, like, you know, most Machiavellian that's, uh, person in the world. That's right. And not, to, like, not to go Sopranos again, but uh, that is why Tony Soprano's mom is named Livia. As a tribute <laughs> okay. to the... Really, didn't, as a tribute to the historical Livia. Because well, Tony's mom is, you know, the, yeah, the yeah. ultimate puppet master, the dark puppet master. Yeah. So. so, well, yeah. So, that I mean, that Robert Graves' portrayal of... Depiction of her and I, Claudius, um, is, is probably not historically accurate. She did not poison half the Julio-Claudian dynasty and arrange for people to be sent into exile and stuff. It's just an interesting way to tell the story with a villain. But that being said, the character of Livia in I, Claudius is great. And this one yeah. is not. Like, she just... 
like I think she tries to come off as like oh I'm as sophisticated as Adia and I'm gonna be the new chief woman in Rome I'm gonna supplant her but like Adia just you know bitch slaps her for lack of a better word in a very famous takedown at the at the very end of the show and I think it's mm-hmm. hard it's hard it's hard to live past that because that's that's the note she goes out on it's just getting you know just owned so so horribly by Adia so <laughs> I'm gonna put her in irrelevant she doesn't really do anything she just I think she chokes out Augustus once. They have weird kinky sex, which again, it's oh, that's like, right. It's like yeah. it's just like why, like, like this. Anyway, it was just we're HBO. We can do it, but do you have to do yeah, it? Yeah, Augustus's love life is is uh, all over the place. He sleeps with his sister, I think, in season one. Oh my god, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, it's like a one and done, and then they both kind of agree, like that was weird, <laughs> but it doesn't inform his character beyond that. Yeah. I, <laughs> It just makes him broadly less likable. Like, a yeah. lot of the details that they use for Augustus. Yeah. All uh, right. Here we uh, are. The man himself. The man, the myth. Yep. I mean, it's top. I mean, I think I could do... We could do a 45-minute episode just on how much I love. we love Polo. But I think it's... Easy. Yeah. It's fairly fairly safe bet that this man belongs at the top. Every scene he's in, he steals. He's, he's, he's charming, but he's also, like, brutish. And he's just so... Uh, he's played perf- Ray Stevenson played him to perfection you know R.I.P. like I I I, uh, I really his his portrayal was great and you know he steals the show you know there are world historical characters some of whom are actually portrayed well like Cleopatra Antony Caesar uh, like they're all you know household historical names that I think are more those those ones at least come off pretty well Uh and like he is still the most memorable character on the show because oh yeah he, he can hang with any of them yeah. easily and i just love like there's this scene he's there's i think everyone probably has their favorite polo scene but there's a scene where he or and, poloism he has so many good yeah. throwaway lines that are just so funny oh and so God. broish he is yeah. mad broish yeah like i, I in I, a charming I, way because one of the first moments of like really being immersed in the show for me was um when him and Varinus rescue Octavian at the mm-hmm. in season one, their season one episode one near the very beginning, Octavian is captured by like the Gauls or the people working for Pompey, and uh, then like and it's along with the Polo. the legionary standard. Yes, yes, which is yes. why Polo and Varinus yeah. are on their, their they're scouting lo- they're mission for is to it. recover the standard. And yeah. Polo kills like they they just make short work of these guys. And then, like, Polo prays to Mars. He's like, look here, Mars. These men are my offering to you. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I was like, that happened. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. Like, that is such, like, a gruff legionary thing to say, like, after he's, like, just butchered four men to be like, Mars, like, thank you for giving me the strength to, like, do this. I'm like, oh, my. Like, and it was a moment that, like, because I had never, like, I knew a lot about Rome, but, like, that was a very lived in moment because like obviously there are no texts that say like and then the roman soldiers would all say thank you mars for letting me kill this but like you just know how people operate how people practice religion and yes not saying, that sense of daily ritual yes not saying everyone would have done this but like when millions of people are living in this culture for thousands of years like if a guy is so desensitized to killing you can imagine him doing a little prayer to mars like that you know so it was just fascinating and then another i could do it all day but my other favorite polo moment is when him and varinus are talking about stars what stars are do you remember that i don't know if i do actually oh it's great they're just at a campfire they're they're traveling from their leading caesar scouting party from uh the rubicon down to rome and so this has got to be pretty early this yeah. is first so, couple episodes first couple episodes and they're leading this scouting party down and they're just at a campfire. They're looking up at the stars at night. And he's like, what are stars? And Varinus, who's so educated and so smart, and he says it so matter-of-factly, he's like, oh, they're, they're holes through which the lights of the heavens uh, pour in. And he's like, and uh, Polo's like, oh, well, could, could a man get up there and climb through one? He's like, no, they're hundreds of miles away. <laughs> and like, and like, it's just great because like Polo and his Polo is like, well, what if you ha- what if you held on to a giant bird and got up there? And it's like, <laughs> and it's so beautiful because it's just like, it's like the inquisitive mind of like a truly ancient man, 
and it's just he's really trying to deal with it like, yeah he's, he's, he's not making fun of Varenus. no he's not and like and it's great because Varenus is answering like according to like a, you know the scientific conventions of the day right the oh, best he's... known yeah yeah it's like and Varenus, and then he's like any he, then so he's like can you what if i held on to a giant bird could i get up there he's like well no he's like why not <laughs> he's like it's philosophy you you can't and he's like oh okay so it's like <laughs> it's just really great like you know how how someone's mind might have operated in that time so anyway polo you know everything he does love him to death yes my my final thought on polo is i have known not a ton of of uh people who served in the military but i've had some good friends over the years who served in the military i never did but uh polo is one of the truest representations of kind of it is a quintessential military personality which is not to say that everyone in the military is like Polo. They certainly right, are. Right, right, right. But there are personalities just like Polo in real life. And a lot of them really thrive in the military. He's kind of a, he's a happy hunter. He doesn't necessarily, it's not about the bloodlust for him. It's about the competence. It's, it's the fact that he's good at his job. He was made to be a fighter. He's good at it. That's what, you know, that's his lot in life. Um, and, and also the fact that when he's not doing that, a lot of the time he wants to go to the city and get drunk and see right. prostitutes. Like, that, that is also true to life for a lot <laughs> of those personalities, at least when they're younger. Um, but yeah, Polo, man. Yeah. He, was, he was always, like, when we were sort of sketching out this episode, we were talking about some of our preliminary categories, like sorting choices, but there was never a question with Polo. Like, he's... He's tippity top, no question. Yeah. Uh, next up, I think this guy's name is Massinus, but he's not. Like, sorry that you have to go after Polo, but that's a tough act to follow. But <laughs> Someone's also got a to. tough act for you because you don't deserve it. Like he was, he was basically their like third in command when Polo and Varinus were mobsters in season two. That's right, and he's. I think he's former military too. Yeah, I think he's one of their legionary buddies, and he gets a job as you know one of the henchmen. But he just, you know, it's like he's the third man in a two man act. Like he's literally the third wheel on a bike. Like he, in scenes with him and Farinas and Polo, it's like, what, dude? No, go just go just go sweep the floor or something. Like, come on, you don't need to be here. I guess it's maybe to, just to give you the sense that Polo and Varinas aren't doing literally everything yeah, by themselves. Yeah. That they have some muscle. So but yeah, agreed. Irrelevant. Not contributing much. Quite literally. Uh, this next lady, I don't know her name, but she is Adia's kind of like uh, one of her primary slaves. Um, but I, I just don't... They don't really do a lot with the relationship there that doesn't feel like lived in. It doesn't feel like Adia respects her a whole lot or she even has a lot to offer. So I'm going to put her... I would say she's irrelevant. Just doesn't do much. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, this this line that we have here, we have a lot of kind of like one and done characters or yeah. characters who exist to to flesh out some aspect of Roman society slightly more. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot of heavy heavy hitters in this line right now. So should we should we hit all the rest of these or should we, we kind move, of pick and choose? We can move through them. We can move through them quickly. Uh, all right, we can... weird choice then. Um, Cleopatra's advisor. I think. I think she's a slave. Yeah. Uh, really weird. Okay, I have to admit, I, I'm a little biased because there's a there's a recent version of Macbeth. Denzel Washington is Macbeth. Uh -huh. I think it, it's the Cohen. No, it's not the Cohen brothers. It's one of the Cohens. Um, but she is the witches. And, oh, all and three. She's it's all recent. three witches. Right? She's all three, and she's so oh, good. She's good. I've seen. And, I've seen. I have not seen the movie, but somebody shared that clip with me, talking about how good it was. And yeah, she's like the past, present, future. Like she's all three at once. I. Yes, yes. exactly. I did not realize her, that. Her, her, her voice, yeah. Great voice, great physical presence. Just kind of, uh, and she's not doing anything creepy. Like my my whole view of that character is so colored by Macbeth at this point that like. Cleopatra, that that's the witch from Macbeth, dude. That's cool. But um, I, I actually yeah, kind of cool like I presence. actually kind of liked her in Rome. Truthfully, I would put her up in good with I would put her with Cleopatra in good because she is she's pa Cleopatra's Pasca. Like I think that yes. 
it's it's a uh, when they've come to execute Cleopatra, she is very distraught. Like, like it's a it's a true relationship. Like they're very, you know, as affectionate as you can be about a person who owns you, I guess. But like, uh, you know, there's a there's a real relationship there. So, um, I liked I liked seeing the two of them together. And I think to to elaborate ever so slightly on that, like yes, Cleopatra is is her owner, but. I think uh, one thing that I encounter regularly when I'm reading history is the sense that like people people can adjust to anything and they do it very quickly. Yeah, like people can be in the most abject, horrifying circumstances, but you don't really have time to sit around and, and lament that fact. You you just kind of get on with it, and so I think there's a really nice dynamic with several of the slave characters, especially I don't remember Cleopatra's slave's name but like her and Pasca, you get the sense that like yes this is not necessarily the lot in life that they would have chosen but they they actually do i don't know i don't, I don't want to fall into the trope of being like they actually like it because i don't think they do but the relationships are real the relationships are right. not yeah. they're not well, purely transactional. I, th- I think it's they've they realize that it's like well i've hitched my wagon to a star so to speak, like, like, yes. when, when, and it, it, when you've just spent a certain amount of time with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's complicated, but I think they, they nail that complicated, sensitive dynamic yes. really yes. well. I agree. I agree with you. Uh, next up, I don't know who this guy is. Who's our next, who's our next fellow on the board? I would vote we skip to, uh, Irene. Okay. I want to do Metellus actually. Okay. All right. Uh, not a big standout to me honestly. no i mean i i just want to do him so we could drop him in irrelevant because i thought he sucked uh but <laughs> but but like <laughs> but like i he sucked in the same way that the real guy sucked because he was like we you talked about pompey being like a guy who coasted on his achievements scipio metellus was like coasting on his like great grandfather's achievements you know it's like oh well i should be the commander of the army in africa because uh obviously like my my grandfather great-grandfather was scipio africanus duh like so you know and it's like and then he gets <laughs> they lose like badly several times to caesar so uh but like this it's, is almost completely sorry go ahead but it's like it's like that that same sense of like entitlement combined with account incompetence which is one of the reasons why i feel like you know caesar was able to beat armies that were larger than him is it, it's like look who's in charge like the titus labienus his his former second in command was a super capable general who had actually beaten Caesar in Africa before, but they wouldn't let him. They were like, Oh, well you can just command the cavalry because you're not from like a traditional noble family. So yeah, the Nepo baby gets the really good. Yeah. The Nep- Nepo, it was all nepotism, Nepo babies. Yeah. And, uh, um, almost completely unrelated, but did you know that in North Korea, uh, members of the military keep the awards that anyone in their family has ever won? So, like, if your grandfather got, I, I don't know the specific, but, like, if your grandfather got the Medal of Honor and you joined the military, you get the Medal of Honor. Oh. So, it's like a running oh, is total that why of they, is that everything. Why when you see a picture of the generals, they have, like, a thousand medals? They have medals on their pants. Yeah. yeah it goes okay. all the way down their jacket to, I mean, not actually, but, but yeah. yeah, that's that's the thing. is It's you're carrying your family's legacy huh. with you, which is not, not maybe the best idea for running a, a functioning military, but there's a nice kind of poetic something yes. there. Yeah, like I, I can I can see how it's like I would be more motivated to get this award if I knew that like it was gonna be in my family forever. But then yeah. But then you also don't want to fall into the trap of thinking like, well, his his grandfather was great, so he's great too. You know, like uh, exactly. So double edged right, sword. Metellus. Uh, we can we can we can make him trash. Trash. Uh, more trash. He, he doesn't even have the guts to kill himself, if you remember. Cato. He's literally just following Cato's lead the entire time, and then Cato goes and kills himself. Oh and, yeah! And he's like, and he has a slave do it for him, which is like the most un-Roman thing you can do is like ask someone else to do that for you. So, sorry. Oh yeah, you know I, I will say speaking of Cato, his suicide scene, I I do sort of like is a little study of Roman attitudes on suicide. Yeah. Not necessarily that it's Cato doing it, but. The idea that's just like, all right, we'll, we'll be a Roman about this. Yeah. Like the do, Roman thing to do, do is right take way. yourself out at this yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, I think we can do, I think we can drop Irene from this, from this second row. Uh, Irene is, I think she's great. 
she's the the woman that Polo loves. So I would put her in great. She's she's good. She humanizes him. She brings out the best in him. And when she when she passes away, he is not a happy camper. So um, yeah. Well, and she was a she was another slave character to begin yes, with. Yes. Um. That's right. And Polo really, I think like yeah, like they. I think the vibe I got from their relationship at first is she's like. Kind of like, oh, great, this guy is like, you know, I'm a slave and this guy just wants me. Like, what what, what say do I have in it? But I feel like his affection for her was genuine. And after a while, she either warms up to it and accepts him or realizes it's, you know, their worst, worst fates. And I think uh, they they try to start a family, but then um, Gaia, you know, gets in the uh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, Irene, uh, she gets so much more dialogue in the second yes, season. I've yes. forgotten how much more characterization she gets as she, I think, feels comfortable enough with Polo to start voicing her opinions without worrying that he's just going to stab her in the chest. Yeah, and like... And it, she's got a little fire to her yeah, also. Yeah, she's, she's well-rounded, and she's not just like... Yeah, I, I liked her, and I thought the actress did a great job because they... They stress that she's like, oh, I don't speak Latin. So, like, she, like, gets... That's one of the reasons she speaks more later is, like, she's, like, learned Latin, enough Latin, I guess, is... So... Yeah. Um, I thought that on the second row, I thought that Servilia's slave, um, that woman, I thought she was good. Um, that's Servilia's slave. And I thought she was great because she's, like, she's Servilia's best friend, basically. And she's there when she... You know, she's reading the love note from Caesar and like she's always at by her side and then she's like helps her commit like do the curse and the suicide ritual. So mm-hmm. like she and then she immediately kills herself right after. So um that I thought she I think she's better than Servilia, but I'll put her in good with Servilia. Okay. That sounds fair. All right, Herod is up next. I, I like this guy. I, I like this Herod. version of Heron. I put him in great because he's he does not get a lot of screen time, but he what he does do, he does do well. Like he just comes in, he's like, I will pay you more than anyone else to give me the throne, basically. Like whatever uh-huh. and so whatever anyone else says, I will double it. And he basically you know, he's very pragmatic. He's like, I don't care, I'll just raise taxes on people. Like, what are they gonna do? They're not gonna fight me and Rome, so <laughs> like, who cares? So yeah. And he's right. It and works. He's right. Yeah, and he's right. So, uh, great depiction of Herod and uh, a great addition. I, I was glad that they found a way to work him in because that was super interesting. Okay, that brings us to the Egyptian court. So, this is, I don't know which Ptolemy he would have been, Cleopatra's brother. A lot of numbers. Ptolemy the 13th, I, I think. That sounds Somewhere right. That there. sounds right to me. That's literally what I was about to guess. But either way, he was unlucky. He got a he got a ride of the deal, <laughs> and uh, I was literally going to guess thirteen because uh, I that must be it. But um, the Egyptian court, I liked those scenes because it was a great way to display how like politics would have worked in a non-Roman system. Like, you know, it's an Eastern court, so they they definitely I think made it as foreign as possible but at the same time it's great because they're you've got the the eunuch advisor and the other guy i guess he's like a priest or something i'm not sure but and they're the ones who are clearly running the show yes they're running the show they're the power behind but i love how they have to do it in such a way of like leading the little boy to the conclusion that they've already arrived at right like yeah it's, it's making him think it's he's coming up yes, with these brilliant yes. ideas that they're feeding to him yes and that i thought that was very well done and it's another thing where it's like you realize like this is a very real depiction of how something like that would have happened at the time you would have and then like what i love is these guys are working together to like you know to work the king and like you know get him to do what they want and then like later when uh, Caesar comes to be like, okay, who ordered Pompey's murder? They both turn on each other instantly, which I absolutely love. Because like, <laughs> yeah, that feels have, true to life. Yeah, it feels, that feels so like true to how life. those personalities like, would operate. Like, like, yeah, a, a court like that, especially during a uh, a regency, you know, it would have just been so backstabby and uh, no love lost between. Like, this literally the second there's a hint of trouble, they're just like, oh, he has his idea. You know, he did it, so I absolutely love it. But anyway, they're not, like, I don't know. I want to rank them all as a group because they're not, they don't do enough. They're not around for long enough to, like, really stand on their own. But I like the scenes I, that I they're I keep all thinking, 
Yeah, I agree. I, I'm leaning good on these yeah. guys. I keep thinking that these two, the two advisors, have a musical number because they <laughs> remind me so much of the characters. And do you ever see the Prince of Egypt? Yes, but it's been ages. Ramses has these two court guys, and Ramses is like a young man, a young adult, but he has these two court guys who are very similar personalities, kind of like magician advisors. They do all of that sort of like uh, mysterious Eastern, you know, yeah. cult coded kind of stuff. But they also have a song. And so okay. I always, when I see Good these guys, them. I'm like, don't they sing it? So <laughs> no. no, they don't. Well, they would have, uh, that would have made, that would have moved them up a tier if they had sung. If they had sung a song and it had not been addressed within the show at all, <laughs> this is the only time anyone sang, but the characters don't acknowledge it. It's just, yeah, it's Egypt, man. Yeah, they do so that. They sing sometimes. <laughs> they sing. Uh, <laughs> all show, right, good. Show what do you think? Uh, yeah, let's put all the Egyptian <laughs> court fellows up in good. Boom. All right. And Egypt then, is well represented at this point in the upper echelons. And then we can blow we can blow through a few more of these, you know, non non essential characters, but I think we'll go with Octavia. Yes. Who, uh, we got three really big ones yeah, to finish. We're ending on. on a high note. Octavia, I liked her a lot, even though she I think suffers this is what we talked about with Karina's that that whiplash and that like inconsistency of like just, you know, dropping doing something and then like like picking up a hobby and dropping it a week later like, now i do drugs yeah yeah, yeah. like she's it's like it seems like she, every episode she's finding a new thing to get into like so uh that being said like i i like carrie condon is a great actress and i've i've really been a fan of hers ever since this show like because the way she plays octavia is just like a normal person right like she's the most normal i feel like she's the most normal person on the show yeah yeah that's a really good point actually and her relationship with agrippa i would say is it's very sweet. maybe second only it's yeah second only maybe to Polo and irene and that like i i genuinely am feeling like you guys are cute i, I want this to work for yeah you. yeah like, yeah and it, of course it can't uh but like yes. she she's <laughs> literally is just a normal person who if she had not been born into a powerful family would just be doing a daily life where her husbands don't get murdered you know like uh yeah so yeah. her life like and she's like, also um she's she's one of the only people who uh octavian will consistently listen to yeah I and think, it's not like she's not a schemer like adia yeah but if she says something he actually takes time to consider it yeah she's got like a like i like i like that their characterization of their characterization of their relationship because she is not like a particularly bright character. Like, I mean, she's not like eating paint chips or anything, but she's not like nothing she does is ever like, wow, she really thought that out and like fooled everybody. Like, so she's not like super clever like some of the other characters, but she's like just she, you, what you see is what you get. And she's a nice, she's a nice person and she's not out to screw anybody. And so I think that's why I she's almost a little bit of a. She's a little bit of a viewer stand-in, almost. Okay, I can see that, yeah. In the, I mean, not directly. We are not experiencing these events through her eyes, but the sense that she's kind of reacting to these yes, incredible, yeah, yeah. world-shaking events the way that most of us probably would. Yeah, because, I mean, all she, a lot of what she does is just react, and, like, her revulsion or disgust is kind of like, yeah, it stands in for, like, the fact that we would typically like uh, like i think she's very in tune with modern sensibilities that's one of the reasons i said she's a normal person because she seems i think what you said about being a viewer stand-in works perfectly she seems very much informed by like 21st century values and norms so uh yeah i would say great or top i really like i really like uh virtually every scene or that she's in like she i think she's great i think the actress is great and the the actual character from history, Octavia, I like her a lot too. Like very interesting uh, Roman matron. So great or top is my vote for Octavia. Let's go top. I like her a lot. We're we're gonna be populating these these top two tiers. Yeah, it's getting here at the it's end. getting it's getting crowded at the top. Um, Mark Antony. Yes. A, a genuinely dangerous feeling personality. For sure. He's he's unstable he's he's like a walking weapon he's yeah he's someone fair. whose entire world is violence 
And anytime he's around, there's the possibility that someone could get hurt. Yeah. Without it having been considered. And it might not be uh, and, the person who deserves it either, you know, like, or yeah, or yeah. even the person who wronged it. Like, he could just take it out on anybody. So, uh, exactly. Once he's off the leash, once Caesar is gone, yes, you see that his political instincts are are not great, and his answer to anything does tend to be violence. Yeah, he's the one who comes up with these long lists of people to be assassinated in the aftermath of Caesar's killing. He's like, well, now that everything's in flux, we got to kill this person, we got to yeah. kill this person. And and Octavian is the one who kind of reels him in and is like, well, maybe we shouldn't just kill everyone <laughs> we don't like. Maybe there's an advantage to being a little more subtle than that. Yeah, I, I like... I think that, A, I think they do the character well because I feel like he is kind of the, the consummate lieutenant. Like, he is a... Like, there's the the phenomenon known as the Peter principle where it's like somebody gets a job and they get promoted. They get a job and they get promoted and they go up the chain, they go up the chain and then they level out somewhere. Right. At and, some point you hit your ability ceiling. Yeah. And it's like, and it's, so it's like the Peter principle says like, well, actually if somebody levels out, you should really demote them to their previous job because that's what they were good at. And that's what got yeah. them a promotion. So it's like, yep. he, so it's like the idea that people will rise one station above where they should be. And I think Antony is a great example of that because like the real one and the one on the show, he 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 does great as the muscle for Caesar, so to speak, um, who can be the you know the the un, do the underhanded tactics and get his hands dirty doing work for Caesar. But like when it's his turn to rule or it's his turn to implement like a strategy that would push him towards the throne, he really just gets outclassed and out outmaneuvered. Um, and you know the thing yeah. is, and he's. He's he's like a violent guy who wants it all, but at the same time, he's never disloyal to Caesar. Like, I it's think, very true. Like, it's it's an interesting phenomenon of like because the second like once Caesar's gone, he's like you know he wants the he wants all the power, he wants all the glory, and he wants he wants to drink all the wine and screw all the women, but like smoke all the smoke. Yeah, when Caesar's there, he never <laughs> wants. Uh, he he. There's no inclination that he wants to he wants the top job. So. Super interesting, and I think that's probably accurate. Uh, yeah, what we know. you're right. But looking at everybody on this list, like if I had to to stage a political, if I had to start a political career, and and all options were on the table, yeah, yeah I'm picking Antony. Like absolutely, he's made to be a number two guy, and he's not really great at being yeah. anything beyond a number two guy. And uh, James Purfoy, Purfoy, however you say his name, incredible job as. Like, so good he is he is great in the role and he he's one of the ones that looks he looks the part so well like i i know anthony had like some this like curly mop on his head according to the statues but like he just seems he just seems cut out for it and his uh i know we've talked a lot about the death scenes like they they do send a lot of characters out in a great way and i thought that his was really good where he's you know he's he's a he's an eastern decadent but then like he demands that that uh, Verenus give him a Roman sword so that he can mm-hmm. cut himself open. Like I thought, like you know, yep. it's, he's coming back to reality. Like, uh, so great character, great actor, great person from history. So he's he's top for me. To the top with him. Mm-hmm. And that leaves us. We didn't with... plan this, by the way. This is it's, it's a I think it's a random generator, but we got it's funny we got Antony and Caesar at the at the tail end of it. But uh, yeah. What can you say? JC's top. The first thing when I was trying to sort of formulate my thoughts about him is: Have you ever read the book Primary Colors? I have not. No. So it's it's a very thinly veiled account of working for the Clinton mm-hmm. campaign on Clinton's first run for president, um, and it was it was published anonymously. I think since then we figured out who published it. I Joe, don't remember the Joe guy's Klein, name off the top I believe, of my head. From Trump. there we go. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, but on page one of Primary Colors, it's this it's this fictional sort of composite character who's an aide to the Clinton guy. And he's talking about, like, th- the emotional instincts of Clinton being like electricity, instantaneous. That when he's talking to someone and he sees the slightest change in their face or he hears the tone of their voice go a little differently or, or, or the way that they give a handshake just that he has this instantaneous electric recognition of how to react to it in a way that's self-serving but also 
totally convincingly authentic. Yeah. And that's he's not as big of a schmoozer. He's not as big of a charmer character as Bill Clinton is. But there's that same sense of like this guy is just prepared to meet every single moment. He's he's not fake. Um, I I don't get the sense that he's not a genuine personality. He's obviously ambitious. Um, but just that this is someone who 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 reacts to everything faster than the rest of us do. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's fair and like. That's probably a great, you know, analysis of how Caesar probably operated. Um, and I think that that's true. And that's so hard to get right on screen, I think. Because you have the the super intelligence of Octavian, but it's off-putting. But you have Caesar who's yes. doing the exact same stuff, but he is cool, he's collected, and he is, you know, everybody's best friend. Right? Like... I mean, other than the people who hate him and, and want to murder him, but everybody else just loves him to death. And I think that that's, like, uh, something that's so fascinating about him is that, like, he's he's clearly ambitious, he's clearly building things up to get what he wants, but people also... He, he has a way to, like, authentically make people believe that, like, acting in Caesar's best interest is in their best interest as well. And, like, sometimes it often is for a lot of the people, but... You know, yeah. he, he can he can make you want to do the things for him, if that makes sense. Yeah, and there's that sense of, of like, when Caesar's talking to you, he's only talking yeah, to yeah. you. And when he's talking to you, you are the most important thing in the world. Even if you don't mean anything to him, he's able to convey that sense that he is utterly interested in whatever your concerns are. Yeah, Syrian Siri, Siri Hines, is... the actor, just knocks it out of the park. The only thing that oh, I don't like, so good. he's not bold. I just shave your head a little, man. Like that's the only. That was literally my only gripe. Like everything else about it, it's it's so calm, it's so calculating, but it's so authentic. Like it's charming, but at the same time Machiavellian. Like it's, I really feel like that's how, you know, because there's so many different versions of Caesar, and we all construct the one we want to kind of believe in. I think, but the one that resonates the most for me is like, yeah, that what you said about this, the person who can identify what you want and show you why it's your, in your advantage to like get, you can get that by working through him. So yes. And there's this one of my, there's a lot of great moments that Caesar has, but I think the best for me is when they're marching back, they've just crossed the Rubicon. They're marching into Rome and Caesar's leading his legion. And they don't know if Pompey's going to march out to oppose them yet. They just know that they're, they've, they're marching in with one legion and uh but they're nearing rome and anthony says wow you look you look as cool as a glass of water and caesar yeah. says caesar says well i'm glad i appear so and it's just like and it's like that's just such a great summation of how it worked like he like there was a lot going on in his head obviously like he's 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 running the tables, so to speak he's he's doing the math he's thinking about who he needs to meet and greet and everything he needs to do when he gets in rome he's worried will this gamble pay off but he's like whoa, well, at least I've, you know, but I'm also consciously trying to let my soldiers know that I'm not worried. And he's like, well, I'm glad that that's mm -hmm. working. So uh, it just showed the multifaceted nature of him. And, you know, he was willing to be a little authentic there with Antony. And, uh, but it was a great line. And it, it's something that showed the true character of the character. Yeah. I mean, he's an excellent study in, in political image making. Yeah. Uh, insofar as he's a representation of the real Caesar and also insofar as he's a fictional character, uh, he's a great study in leadership. Got to talk about his death for a second. Okay. They they don't hit you with et tu brute. I was surprised by that initially, yeah. Which is not, it's not what he would have said. I mean, I right. think the account is that he said in Greek, uh, kaisu technon, and you child. But... Um, doesn't say anything. Yeah, his I, last yeah. moment, he covers his face with his toga, and he that's just kind of grabs. I don't. I don't even. I don't even think he did that. I thought he. I think he like tried, but he didn't. If it's I, a very yeah, it's a small gesture. It's not really successful, but it's like he's trying yeah. to cover himself, trying to get some sort of privacy or dignity in his last moment, but can't even really do it. Yeah, yeah, and, and I just remember the look of like he's completely shocked, like. Like, it's, like, the horror of it all. Like, like it's all coming crashing down. Like, it's a great, 
portrayal of you know the end of, of caesar's life i felt like and i think it's probably like as much as we want to be like oh at two brute that's so powerful or even kaisu technon uh like those those words are are landmark words for like all of western culture for two thousand years and we want to believe in them but like probably his you know probably didn't have any last words you know 23 stab wounds that's you're not going to be super vocal for very long uh, with with that going on right so. yeah and another great thing about that scene is um we all know that caesar got stabbed a whole bunch of times like it's it's one of those things you don't even seriously give thought to because yeah. you know people make like pencil holders in the yeah, shape yeah, of julius that, caesar yeah. and you put your pencils in the back but it, the scene reminds you so vividly of how horrifying and how visceral and how violent yes. it would be for a dozen people to cut you up at the same time it's genuinely horrifying. Yeah. And however you feel about Caesar and his ambitions, I think even the assassins in those last moments looking at him cut to ribbons trying to to cover himself up, I think there's a moment of like, oh, my God, that that was yeah. not as glorious as I was anticipating. Yeah, and I mean, it's and I think they do it well because it's like these are not these are the senators, right? Like these are not the guys who are used to getting their hands dirty. They're not fighting like if any of them were in the military, they were definitely not fighting on the front lines. Like, they, it's it's doubtful any of them ever actually like you know stabbed a guy, or if they did, it wasn't like face to face. Like you know, so uh, but that's all portrayed well. That yeah, even like I think especially Brutus, you see it mostly through his eyes. Like he he, I think the vibe I get is he regrets having done it, but he realizes the course is like irrevocable, right? So he has to finish the job. Yeah, because he has that moment where. He's he's horrified, but then he steals himself and he gives him the last stab. Which he finishes I always, him off. which I always view as like him putting him out of his misery more than like, like because I think there's two ways to read the final stab from Brutus. It's either like, this is for you, you son of a bitch, you know, or hey, like, let's let's make quick work of this, you know, like kind of like how Polo does for Cicero, right? Um, yeah. The way I see it, the way I always saw, the way Brutus stabs him at the end is he finds a spot where he's like well this you're you're gonna bleed out in like five minutes so it's either gonna be super long and agonizing or i can just do this now and i think that's kind of what it looks like he's not happy about having to do it and i think he kind of like regrets that he's got to this point but he's also like now he realizes i'm irrevocably on a collision course with antony with octavian with the caesar loyalists and like they won't they won't hear me out that like, oh, well, I was part of the conspiracy. Yeah, but I didn't stab until the end. So he's like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> that ship has sailed. I'm with these guys. And to, know, to steal a line. Yeah. The die is cast. The die is cast, quite literally. So great. Yeah. But yeah, great scene and doing, doing justice to one of the pivotal characters of world history. Super hard to do, especially over like, because Julius Caesar is great in the play Julius Caesar, but he's on screen for like six minutes, you know, so yeah for, to do an entire season where you're se- in dozens of scenes as caesar and for each one to be compelling and interesting syrian hines tipping our cat to you sir and uh just saying great job top tier no doubt about to it. to the top with him all right all right guys well if you have stuck with us through I, this whole thing seek help you are <laughs> <laughs> you are you are truly our people yeah if you have made it through this whole ride with us um we just want to thank everybody one more time for, for being a part of the channel. Uh, we are so excited that we get to do this and we get to to nerd out and people will willingly nerd out with us. It means the world. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we, uh, we're we trying our hand at this new stuff with, uh, with, a, with a little bit of different content, but we're going to iron it out. Each one, each one of these little forays into more casual stuff will get more, better and more interesting and we want to bring fan interaction into that as well. And uh, but thank you again for for tuning in. And uh, as always, sound off in the comments. Let us know what you think we got wrong, what you agree with, uh, and what what was an unforgivable sin on our part in terms of who we've <laughs> who we've misplaced on the tier. All right, everyone. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you next time. Take care.